Okay, um, let's get going. Um, I'm Rahul Mehrotra. Uh, I am an architect and a professor here at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. And a really warm welcome uh, to you all. Uh, and many thanks for joining us um, today to kick off what is really an important component of our project on the state of architecture in South Asia. This is a project that we kicked off with its research component earlier this year. Uh, with a conference we had organized at the university with MoMA from New York to coincide with a show on architecture in South Asia that they had installed. And uh, this project also extends many strains of research that have occurred over the years in the form of books and exhibitions on architecture in India, but also in South Asia uh, more broadly. Uh, however, what is different about this new endeavor is that uh, of us, of an aspiration of finding common ground, of finding ways through architecture that we can unite and engage together in conversations about architecture in the region of, of South Asia. You know, a lot has happened in the last seven decades since the different nation states comprising South Asia were formed. Uh, clearly, at you know, in the 40s and the 50s, uh, all these nations through modernism, through other modes and stylistics, stylistic deployments, were obsessed with the notion of the construction of national identities, right? So that was uh, the, uh, the central driving theme in some ways, creating a brave new world, creating new formations, uh, trying to you know, bring peoples together through architectural formation and identities. Now, I think, Oh, seven decades later, what's very clear is that there are a host of commonality of issues that we are dealing with because this whole region is in acute transition. And I think this is really the central agenda of our project, to find that common ground, to articulate what might be the other drivers and issues uh, that we can resituate the instrumentality of architecture. And so this idea of common ground is very important to us. You know, in the South Asia Institute, uh, one of my colleagues, Gina Kim, uh, he, she is working on the notion of color as a common ground uh, through uh, the arts uh, in South Asia. Because of course we do uh, share an amazing platform of culture, uh, which is shared cultures and not all similar. Of course, there are many regional differences, uh, but there are also many similarities. And so the notion of common ground is very exciting, especially in this condition of transition. Today, multiple transitions and ensuing uncertainty characterize not only our planetary condition, uh, but also it's, uh, the condition in South Asia. Transitions triggered by climate change, shifts in politics, economics, cultural circumstances, among several other. In South Asia, these transitions take on an even more extreme form in people's daily existence. And it is in the South Asian landscape of extreme paradoxes and dramatic transitions that architecture has played a poignant role. In this context of rapid change, architecture and its different forms of engagement with society, whether it's preservation, reconstruction or new building, force societies to look in different directions and allow other possibilities, not only spatial organization, but also identity formation, and more deeply the representation of their aspirations. And so does architecture matter in these states of transition? And I think that is a key question. And we believe this collective question will not only resonate across the different countries in the South Asian region, but, but these gathered reflections will be mutually productive given the incredible common ground we historically and culturally share. So what does the practice of architecture in the region mean for the next generation? And that's why we are starting the whole project with giving a platform to the next generation. Can architecture address the abject inequities that have surrounded us in South Asia? What does practice mean for women architects in South Asia, for the making of the architect, which is architectural education? So there's a spectrum of issues I hope we can address. And so the components of the project is we start off today uh, in this sort of inaugural session with creating a platform for younger architects, practitioners just starting in the last decade uh, out their own practices and pursues. And what 
And for us, we, we, we wanted to do that because we feel that gives us the true pulse of what the concerns are on the ground. And so this component of the project is looking at contemporary practices. It's a lecture series, which is virtual. The other components are the mod modalities of practice, which would hopefully be a portal or some other format. The architecture of transitions, which is the centerpiece of this project, is uh, about frameworks and practices in South Asia. And we hope to pull that off as a conference where uh, after the end of this series, we can gather a bigger group. Uh, and we hope then we will be able to culminate this in some form that we can disseminate it through an exhibition uh, or otherwise. And so uh, this lecture series kicks off today. The next lecture is on the October the 8th, also a Saturday, Varna Shashidhar uh, from India and Anand Sonecha from India will speak. And October 15th, which is also a Saturday, we have Vinu Daniel Rohan Chauhan. And very soon we are going to announce the whole series, which will engage about 16 practitioners from the whole region. So before I introduce the speakers, I would just like to very quickly thank the LMSAI, which is the Lakshmi Mittal South Asia Institute, uh, and uh, uh, Selman uh, Rafi, who has sort of helped us pull this all together, and Hitesh Hathi, who directs the Institute for their support, uh, Architecture Foundation, and Ela Singhal, who's their director, based in Mumbai. And most importantly, the student group, the South Asia GSD, uh, with its co-chairs, Pranav and Dhruv, uh, and also uh, Amna and Rolo, who are part of this core team. So thank you all for making all of this happen and ha making it happen, I hope, over the whole year. So to introduce our speakers, our inaugural speakers demonstrate what I was calling was this common ground I was referring to, and that, they, and that, and that their work really addresses these very basics in our society. And herein, I believe, lies the common ground, a commonality of challenges for the present generation or emerging practices and change makers. Yeah? So Nipal Adhikari is going to be our first speaker. He's a graduate of the City College of New York. Uh, he founded Abari, A-B-A-R-I, in 2007. Uh, and his real goal was to reappropriate traditional materials like bamboo and earth in contemporary architectural contexts. And so when the earthquake of April 2015 struck Nepal, all the structures that survived unscathed, including two buildings, were buildings that were built at the epicenter. And in this Last five years, he's built many structures like government schools, libraries, community center homes, and even luxury hotels, keeping these concerns of traditional materials, uh, but also responding uh, to contingencies uh, uh, like earthquakes, etc. And I think one of his biggest achievements has been to provide a kind of new reputation, a kind of reigniting of an interest to the dying building crafts. Pre-earthquake, people thought bamboo and earth in his view, were weak and retro. Uh, but now, as he is finding new interpretations for these materials, they're being embraced even in major urban areas. And he has mobilized farmers to plant bamboo. So he's sort of looking at the broader ecology of his aspiration in terms of building and has mobilized farmers to plant bamboo along riverbanks, uh, you know, where they would flourish, uh, in, in this case, in Chitwan, which apart from restoring land, provides income through various craft baits opportunities. But so, as you know, bamboo has so much application uh, in daily lives. He also teaches at the Kathmandu University and has trained hundreds of architects and artisans. He was a finalist in the 2018 Architectural Review Emerging Architects Award. The organization Bari is socially environmentally committed to research, design, construction, uh, and encourages and celebrates vernacular ar architectural traditions, uh, as I said, in a way that they can be drawn into contemporary uh, design practices. And Rizvi Hassan uh, is, uh, uh, is from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, he graduated in 2017. And his practice, he has been exploring various roles uh, for design professions that are kind of you know, in unconventional fields. So he really is someone who aspires to draw other disciplines into intersections, at least as modes of questioning what the instrumentality of architecture is. Observation, materiality, environment, and learning from each other in this sort of interdisciplinary mode has been very key to his design process. 
uh, uh, in, in building, imagining, constructing, and all of that. And he's been working with a number of international NGOs, organizations, uh, you know, Oxfam, uh, BRAC, uh, which is a major university and organization foundation in Bangladesh, uh, the IOM, UN Migration Group, et cetera. And among his recent works have been the Rohingya uh, Cultural Memory Center, a health facility, uh, in Hindu Para, a community center. Uh, he's also been looking at safe spaces for women and girls. Um, and uh, so a lot of his work evolves around the well being of communities and how, how architecture can be in service for that. And, you know, he has been recognized. Uh, 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 UNOCHA declared them, his team, as uh, real life heroes in 2020. And he's been recognized by the Guardian in 2020. And more recently, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture uh, has recognized him in 2022. His team's approach is to see architecture as a tool to connect people, to strengthen mental health, to enhance culture, to address conflict and peace, to enrich the ground, and sometimes just to ensure basic needs, uh, but very important ones. And quality of life is really something that they try to articulate. And so just to quote him, he says, for countries like ours, we believe architects have a lot to offer in creating a better quality of life related to the environment we all live in, not just buildings. So this larger ecological thinking around these questions. Some architects use spirituality, I'm quoting him, in their practice. Some like to see it as art, while others think straight rational. But one thing is common, everyone works to achieve a better way and by extension, a better of quality of life. So with that, uh, with those words, I'm going to request Nepal uh, to share his screen and share with us his thoughts. And after that, Rizvi, you can follow once he's done. And then we'll have a discussion at the end where Amna will represent the student group and join me in the panel with the speaker. So Nepal, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul and your team. Uh, Go nice full to... screen, Nepal. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No. Is all good? Can you see? The thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Raul. Thank you for giving us space to show our work. So basically, as you introduced me, you know, like we've been trying to use, we think we've got a lot of wealth of knowledge in our traditional system. So we're trying to see how it can fit in the modern paradigm, right? So I'm trying to, I'm seeing like, you know, what the vernacular means in the 21st century. Uh, so if you like, if, if you look at the Nepali map, you know, it's uh, for people who don't know, it's uh, between India and China and right under the Himalayas. So we've got uh, from 80 meters to 5,000 or higher up to, you know, Mount Everest to 8,000 meters within 300 uh, kilometers uh, distance. So that means a lot of variation in climate, in culture, in, and, uh, and definitely consequently in architecture. So, I mean, I've been like, since the beginning, my, you know, I didn't want to like build first because I wanted to see, I was really fascinated by our traditional architecture. You know, you go to the mountains, you have beautiful rammed earth buildings with thick walls and then you come to the south you have like buildings on stilt uh, bamboo structures and you see like you know this building is 600 years old and now it's considered like kacha you know like I, I think we all know that term uh, weak or even illegal like you know like this building I took I took a picture of this uh, from the epicenter of the earthquake this had survived but today, if you want to build something like this, you don't get the permit, you know, like you figure out, you know, or, you know, we have this beautiful stone architecture, you know, also earthquake resistant, you know, like dry stack stone. If you look at the surrounding, all, all they have is stone and, you know, beautiful structure, like multi-level structures uh, with uh, walkways on the top. Um, so we have, or if you come to the south, you know, we have this, um, this is a picture I took over the years uh, of this structure, it's bamboo and earth. You know, like every 
year after monsoon, you know, like they do this beautiful painting. Like you see 2008, you have this beautiful, uh, like blue colored, like uh, painting. And then the monsoon comes and it washes it off, but they don't see it as a chore or as like, you know, there's the problematic is not there as we see it. And then they paint it again. And then next year the rain comes and they paint, repaint it. So it's kind of like a moving exhibition. And I'm like, wow, looking at these structures, you know, and then we, or even like look at this um, structure, a, a bridge from 1895, 30 meters long, uh, made with bamboo. Um, you know, it's did its uh, job. But unfortunately, we don't see these structures anymore. Like this, uh, this it's a dead tradition. It's not even dying. Uh, I mean, and also the one it's cut, Nepal is one of the fastest urbanizing countries in the world, like at 10% per year. So that means uh, if you look at this uh, data, if you look at overall Nepal's data, only 10% of the country has cement, like, you know, like cement penetration. But every year it's changing really fast. You know, like if you look at certain areas like the Midwest, 85% um, of the buildings are with traditional material. So, you know, I felt like our, you know, the bigger narrative, the architectural narrative in the country is like heading in the wrong direction. You know, it's, uh, in one hand we have like a beautiful architectural tradition. And on the second hand, like, you know, we are not we, we are not even like encouraging it. We sometimes we are even like criminalizing it or banning it altogether, right? So if you look at this uh, picture from, uh, this is a street in Kathmandu in 1967, you know, beautiful row houses built with adobe and like terracotta and wood. And the same street now you look uh, 2016, you know, it's all concrete, right? So, I mean, you can guess which looks better, but you know, like the, the bottom one is considered more modern or more contemporary. Uh, or you look at this picture of Kathmandu, you know, with beautiful terracotta, with courtyards, open spaces, you know, um, like very human scale. And the same uh, view today, it looks like this, right? We've kind of, there's no identity, right? Like this could be a structure anywhere in the world, right? You cannot like, you know, like Kathmandu has eight World Heritage sites, but now if, if you look in the last 50 years, what we've built has no heritage, has no identity, no vernacularity. So, you know, it's kind of, I think like the Corbusier's dream of like, you know, this uh, international style, whether you are, you know, in, in Nepal or Dhaka or Moscow or anywhere, you know, this concrete frame structure is, is now considered, you know, that's the modus operandi. That's, that's the ultimate, that's what we consider to be the safest uh, structure. But unfortunately, last earthquake, you know, we saw in the epicenter, you know, these buildings are not as strong or durable as they had promised, right? And like when you build this, there's nothing you can reuse about it. So, or on the other hand, you know, like the traditional structures, this is from the epicenter, can survive the earthquake. But yet, you know, even after the earthquake, the narrative still things like, you know, this kind of structure is kacha, this structure is not safe, you know, like we have this whole agenda of build back better, which criminalizes uh, this kind of architecture. So, you know, in this term, like, you know, in this context, I wanted to do something that, you know, kind of celebrates uh, the tradition, you know, and we're not working as a conservationist. We're not saying, oh, like, let's go and build, you preserve what we have. But I'm saying like, that could be a really interesting departure point, right? It could be, you know, that's something where, from where we can build. And for personally, you know, like my goal was, you know, when I looked at these buildings, you know, like these concrete buildings, for me, it was a death trap, 
right? Not just like it doesn't look beautiful or it doesn't look like a, in, inspiring to be in. It's a death trap, like, you know, like a, a young people like us, we could never build something like this in Kathmandu or like, you know, where like in your hometown, like, because it's, it's extremely expensive. Uh, and, you know, like, so in this, context, you know, I had this, uh, when I was traveling in, in North Nepal, like close to Bhutan border, I saw these, uh, you know, bunch of women, like they were ramming this house, right? They were, so they would come in the, uh, in the morning, you know, the guys would come and make a form work and the women would come, you know, after their farm and then they would, uh, they ram their house, right? So, the, or whatever the soil you get, you get it from from the surrounding and you know like the timber you get it from the forest you know like the only cost of that building would be like you know a few sheep uh, that the owner would have to uh, give to his uh, to the volunteers to the neighbors who can't come like, you know it was a, it was a very joyful moment you know like i you want to play this video <laughs> So, you know, if you look at, if you, uh, you know, it's interesting, once they finish their song, the ramming, one layer of ramming is finished. So I was like, you know, and it cost nothing. It was beautiful homes. And I'm like, hey, why can't we build something like this in, in our context? So I took a challenge upon myself. I said, you know, I want to do something like, you know, I didn't know, I, I don't want to change the world, but first thing, like, you know, I want to start from myself. So I wanna see like, you know, if I can build something from, from what's available and something like beautiful, more exciting, right? So more like more inspiring, more poetic. So one of the materials was bamboo, you know, it's unfortunately, it's not considered timber in our country. That means the regulation allows, you know, it's, it's very easy to cut bamboo. And we've got like lots of species of bamboo 54 species um, and it's called the cultural association you know it's grows really fast it can be like compared to steel in its strength you know like something like that fits all the boxes in in terms of sustainability and you know some people compare it to steel but i think it's uh, it's even better than steel i'd rather compare it to carbon fiber you know where they use in state of the art um, uh, products, right? So because it's strong and lightweight. So I was like, yeah, you know, and there's nothing in, in the material that you can't use, you know, you can eat, uh, eat it when it's young and you can make fibers when it's, uh, you know, a few years old and when it's mature, you can make beautiful structure. And we've got bamboo in, like everywhere, you know, in all of, southern hemisphere so you know like if that intervention i thought it's something that could scale so my first project you know it's it was i i took this land you know like i wanted to be like be off the land right so so there's this land you know i inherited from my father like so and it was like a riverbank right there's nothing like it was uh, you know it's like stones and gravels and nothing so I'm like thinking, you know, like, can I restore it? You know, I've been hearing a lot about bamboo, like, you know, of, of its regenerative capacity. So, so I took a, I did a, a time lapse. So this is a 2001 uh, and 2005, you know, if you just follow this river. Um, so it's the river is changing its course every year, you know, it's going up and down. And on 2010, you see all this white area and it's like a big flood and, you know, this place became inhabitable. So I'm thinking like, you know, what if I plant bamboo? And, you know, in four years, if you look at the riverbanks, 
it's almost there in 2018 you know like it's restored like pretty well you know now the birds are coming back you know there we have like fish ponds and like you know the whole community is kind of on board right so we're building with bamboo you know we're building like a lot of interesting things i'll show you in subsequent slides you know like we have homestays and we have like we're bu building bamboo bicycles and i'm thinking wow this is such an amazing material you know something that's you know i mean truly sustainable you know it's from cradle to grave it's within like 100 kilometers and it's like you can see the whole process uh, not within your lifetime but within a de decade right so and so this is the same picture you see now right and so you know after building this community well, which was very important for me i'm like so what can we do like you know like now you know we have the resources what can we do so pre earthquake you know we are like think we built this hall you know, pre-earthquake, very young kids, you know, nobody's listening to us, right? And so, but, you know, like when we say, let's build with bamboo and earth, people are like, no kidding, you know, because you know, we've lived in with bamboo and earth all our life. Uh, you don't come here and tell us what to do. But, you know, after like a lot of convincing, you know, like uh, working with them, co-designing, so slowly we build this structure and people are like, oh, interesting. This is not what we thought. And, you know, like we, we were like getting a little bit confident. And I said, after this project, I said, you know, like all our, you know, schools in Nepal, I'm sure this is true in all of South Asia, they are pretty basic. And I mean, to say it lightly, it's very inspiring with like metal sheet and cinder blocks, right? So I said, why don't we build something like these schools with local material? So, you know, with like, with dirt cheap budget, you know, like with like volunteer labor, we build this school, you know, like with stone masonry and like some stone slate, uh, bamboo roof, uh, you know, like we were recycling everything, you know, like literally, I mean, this project cost nothing is, and we were, you know, we took this beer bottles and put it in for the lights and put drain pipes for the windows, you know, we took earth and then we plastered and, you know, as we were like slowly getting funds for furniture, the earthquake happened. And coincidentally, this happened to lie right at the epicenter of the earthquake. And, you know, like this was the only building that in the region survived the earthquake. And, you know, like people were like, wow, you know, all of a sudden people are like taking our interviews and, you know, like we are on BBC, like, so we got famous, so to speak. And so we are like, okay, then we went to the government and said, hey, we built our credibility. Uh, we want to build your schools with uh, these materials. And we said, you know, we, we are a small team, but we want to uh, give us the design. We make it open source so people can copy it, you know. So, you know, we took the traditional design and like broke it down. You know, we didn't want to go drastically in the design. We just wanted to make it modular. So, you know, it becomes more inspiring to be inside, right? You, with better insulation, with better paint, rainwater harvesting. Um, and then we built this, you know, we made it open source and, you know, like with earth and bamboo, you know, like, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, inside, you know, we have this furniture, like we have these modular joints uh, for the roof, you know, very, very warm. And the first effect when people come, it's like, oh, wow, it feels good. You know, it smells good with the earth, it, the bamboo, you know, like people were like, everybody's lived in bamboo house, but they're like, oh, man, this feels better. This feels nicer. You know, I want to build something like this. And we, we trained it, you know, we gave the technology to women, to, to people like, you know, like they're very excited. Um, and, you know, like if you 89% of the materials stayed locally, it, it was great news. But, uh, you know, and also we built like these uh, open source homes, you know, for like, it was about three lakh rupees about, or about 3000 US dollars, you know, the government was giving. So, you know, something that can be scaled, something that's more dignified. But unfortunately, you know, the government didn't ha had other plans. You know, they wanted to build 
quick, build back better, you know, so the approval process was difficult. You know, but <laughs> interestingly, while we were thinking of building this, you know, scaling it and, you know, something that, uh, the more interested people were something like not the government people, but uh, more, you know, environmentally conscious uh, people like, you know, uh, private clients, which is, which is a good sign because, you know, like they're putting their own money. It's not like NGO money. So it's like, you know, they have, you know, they have a lot of stake at uh, like what get, gets built. You know, they have a lot of, um, you know, like oversight. So the first project we got was uh, to build a library, you know, which had collapsed, you know, and it was right at the center of the capital, Kathmandu, you know, in Patan, like, and we built uh, using bamboo, you know, we exposed it, you know, traditionally bamboo has this connotation of being very poor, but, you know, we built this, you know, like we celebrating the material and putting lights and, you know, like kind of like combining the, the contemporary materials with the traditional ones and, you know, creating a new, new vocabulary, right? You know, like building big space and, you know, it was a big leap of faith for like, you know, in our architectural community, you know, like, you know, for something that's tabooed to be building like a public space in the center of the city, you know, like we use a lot of vernacular architectural elements, you know, the windows, the, you know, the paint, rammed earth, you know, like, uh, but we had those concrete bands where we needed for the earthquake, you know, like, so it was like pick and choose, you know, we are very, judicially using the materials uh, which were right. Um, or like, you know, we had these modern joints, um, you know, there's a different view. Um, so, you know, like all of a sudden there's like, uh, you know, a lot of excitement with us and like, you know, like a lot of even like some people in the government are excited, you know, oh, this could be a nice change. And then we got an opportunity to build another school, you know, like somehow like for last few years, I was building schools. Um, and so we built this again in a, you know, re relatively low budget, you know, in, uh, in a rural part of Nepal, you know, like just celebrating the local earth, you know, look at you see beautiful yellow clay, red clay, you know, and yeah, just celebrating the materials and then like uh, woven bamboo, you see it and it has big light windows, you know, like reminding a lot of like traditional structures. And then so how we built was, you know, like classrooms and open space, classroom, open space, uh, so a reminding of like our traditional, what we call PD, it's kind of like a courtyard, inner built courtyard, um, you know, like, um, like you see all the trees we've put celebrating bamboo, like open spaces, a lot of greens, trying to be even like sustainable in terms of food. We didn't put any decorative plants. We put vegetables so you know, the kids can come and take the vegetables and eat. Um, here you see, like we don't put any cement, you know, except uh, for the foundation and for, um, for the ring beam, but mostly, you know, if, if it do, does the job, why not, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, like here's uh, like play space. We took the bamboo, we took the truss and kind of modified it. So it becomes, you know, acts as a, has a pedagogical like feel to it. You know, the kids can go climb, you know, on it. And so, you know, like when we go to the classroom, sometimes you see kids are climbing on these uh, structure. So, you know, like a jungle gym incorporated into the structure, uh, right? So, yeah, uh, again, here's the different details of the structure. And again, the classroom, like, you know, for little rural kids, you know, um, it's a different view. <clears throat> again, open spaces. And so I, I, I tell people like what you can do with uh, modern structures, you can do even better. Like what you can do with steel even better because it's lightweight and perfectly um, suitable to our context, right? It's, um, you know, it, it's really cool. Like this uh, area where we at, it's like 45 degrees uh, during summer. But when you enter like 
you have the cool breeze and like, you know, this structure is kind of like an accordion. You, you can open the screens and let the light come in um, or, you know, uh, halls, you know, to speak like uh, using just everything that's locally available. Uh, or others like housing too, you know, like building on stilt so that it becomes flood resistant. It's cool, you know. So, you know, like taking care of these elements, you know, um, in like in context, but also, you know, making it look more poetic, right? Because as I said, these are all like private funded projects, right? So it's not like we can be, um, right? So people have their, yeah, risks and concerns and, you know, or like a private house, right? Mm. Again, like, you know, just using elements. Um, yeah, yellow clay, red clay. Okay, so yeah, that's about it. And to end, you know, like we're playing, make, uh, you know, having lots of fun, you know, like making bamboo bicycles. So we're creating this community, you know, like creating this, giving this uh, material a credibility, right? So, you know, like that it deserves, you know, for many years we've been saying like, this is gotcha, this is not strong, it's, but the earthquake said something else. No, it can be strong, it can be beautiful, it can be open, you know, it can create a, a different language that's uh, relative to our context, you know, it's not like, you know, it's architecture can be fun, you know, like you can be, uh, you know, with with the bottom bamboo, you can be building columns and the top bamboo, you can be building bicycles because it's such a versatile material. Yeah, with that, I end my talk. And thank you. Not, I can take. Yeah. Thank you, Nepal. <laughs> thank you. You've given us a lot to. You've given us a lot to think about, and we are going to have Rizvi now share his work. I just want to say one thing, which I'd like to pick up in the conversation, but I just want you to use the time to reflect. I mean, one of the very interesting things was how you went from you know, a project you did, I'd be very curious to know who the client for that first school was and how you connected with them or was it a self-initiated project? And then you go to the government and then you go back to civil society, NGOs, and the private sector. And so this notion of patronage, you know, when we are trying to show these alternate modes, patronage becomes important. So let's reflect about that a little bit during the conversation because I'm sure it'll come up in Rizvi's presentation too. So Rizvi, over to you, thank you. Hello, thank you Rahul for having me here and uh, Nepal for your amazing presentation. Uh, I think uh, your uh, idea really gives the, idea, uh, gives the notion of uh, how we should uh, rethink uh, architecture and uh, these uh, uh, this materials that we have forgotten and uh, uh, that was not in the contemporary practice, but it can be uh, revived and rethought and uh, this can be a very, uh, uh, it, 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 can, it can be a very uh, a detailed uh, a point for the research of design and designers can think of these ideas. So I'll, I'll start my uh, uh, presentation now. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so uh, we are calling our uh, way of uh, working into presence for a wider spectrum. Uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, actually working in different places in Bangladesh, uh, uh, in Dhaka, in Silet, in Jinnad, and uh, Uthiya, Tekna. Uh, uh, and uh, our presence have been very important for us to, uh, to, to work and uh, uh, make impact uh, in, in different contexts. And um, uh, I, have, uh, I have actually graduated uh, 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 very recently in 2017 uh, from Kuwait, and uh, I, uh, we started uh, uh, working with uh, with one question, uh, and that is the what are the roles of an architect? Uh, uh, let's say. Um, so uh, so many many people really suggested as many different things that uh, okay architects do this and that, and some even said uh, it's a, it's a profession of uh, uh, elderly people, <laughs> and uh, it was very confusing for us. Uh, and then uh, we we rethought the question that. Uh, uh, maybe we should uh, think the question in a way uh, 
that uh, what are the roles of a person instead of an architect? Uh, are we limiting, limiting ourselves with one identity? Maybe uh, when I graduate from an architecture school, uh, I, I uh, burden myself with this identity that I am an architect and I have to do certain things uh, and I have to think in a certain way. Um, uh, but when I, when, I, when I keep that and I start thinking uh, myself as a, uh, as a simple citizen uh, or a simple uh, responsible person, uh, I have a lot of windows open in front of me. So, uh, so after graduation, uh, I went to Jinaida uh, to learn from one of my mentors, Sandhagar Hasbul Kobir. Uh, he has been uh, working uh, uh, in Jinaida for, uh, for a long time uh, with the community to develop the, to develop the city, to develop the water bodies and everything. So, uh, so when, when I went there, I found out that uh, uh, during the design process, uh, it, it is not just uh, the architect who is excited about about these uh, whole uh, ideas or notions of, of environment. Uh, you see all the people, there is the mayor, there are the school teachers and uh, all the community people. And, and the banner you see behind, it, it was just rendered by us. Uh, but, but when we created the platform, a lot of lot new conversations started happening. So I learned a lot of uh, things from here that how uh, we can really incorporate other professionals, as I mentioned before, as Rahul mentioned before. Um, uh, so later, I, I really uh, tried to uh, uh, incorporate that in my design process. So uh, in 2018, um, uh, I, I, uh, I came to this context in Technop and Okia. Uh, you know, the influx happened in 2017, uh, about a million re refugees uh, from Myanmar fled to Bangladesh. And and, uh, and they needed a lot of housing uh, spaces, community spaces, and a, a lot of basic support and all sort of that. Um, uh, so uh, we went there we, and we found ourselves in the midst of a lot of people uh, who are already working there. They're like uh, anthropologists, psychologists, mental health specialists, and uh, uh, everyone. So uh, we, instantly, uh, we instantly found ourselves among them and uh, started learning a lot different other aspects of life uh, uh, from, uh, from, from these people. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and we started thinking that only thinking about the uh, built environment is not uh, the issue in this context. We have to contribute in any way uh, uh, that we can. So we started communicating with these people, building relationships, friendships, and everything. And uh, uh, we also started uh, showing off our some skills. Uh, uh, like very stupid 3D models and um, uh, like a basic uh, uh, a basic model, three-dimensional model and everything. But uh, they were very excited to see these uh, in, in the screen and, uh, uh, and that we have this ability to uh, just not just only uh, have a discussion, but also to visualize. And uh, many, of, uh, many of them started uh, being interested to, to uh, come to us to talk about this new space they want to build and all sort of things. And uh, we started building uh, with them. Uh, many things happened, many failures happened as well. And we learned from them how to deal with the local materials or, uh, or artisans or vendors or, or what should be the uh, appropriate way to work in such a context. It was, uh, it, I will say probably uh, the first six months we had to really understand and learn from the context that what should be the appropriate way. So um, architecture has been a very useful tool for us in this context. Sometimes to connect, sometimes to build trust, to help people, uh, and for so many other reasons. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, sometimes to address peace and conflict because, because uh, the refugees uh, have fled to this context and uh, among the host communities and refugee communities, there were a lot of uh, issues arising and uh, we, we, we came to learn from our colleagues and uh, came to the discussion of okay, how we can really mitigate these uh, issues. So, so uh, uh, the project we are looking at, uh, it is, a, it is a, the center and, uh, and the context we are looking at, uh, it is a mix of host communities and refugee shelters. So the, so the process was if any host community building has a backyard or open space, 
a shelter can be built there. That 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 place is uh, uh, that place is had a rent by a uh, NGO and they build the sh shelters for the refugees. So that's how these refugees are allocated in this particular uh, particular camp, uh, camp 25 in Jekna. Uh, but that also uh, started uh, a lot of issues as well, a lot of conflicts, uh, gender-based violence and a lot of things. So, uh, so uh, Bragg and uh, our colleagues started thinking that maybe we can, uh, we can design a safe space uh, where these addresses can be uh, addressed, uh, these issues can be addressed, and uh, um, and uh, maybe they can feel safe and counsel with the expert. So we immediately designed a space. Uh, uh, it is a safe space for women and girls. Um, so the idea was to build a structure uh, that that isolates one one space, one inter space from the surrounding, and is the uh, very uh, uh, safer vibe, uh, and uh, and and inside the courtyard, uh, uh, the courtyard can be used by different age groups, uh, adolescents, uh, elderly women, and children, and uh, uh, all of them. So we try to we try to make the interior a bit colorful, uh, and the exterior very ragged, so that uh, uh, it uh, it doesn't draw much attention from outside. And, uh, and uh, and uh, it, it had a lot of success because uh, when the uh, when the elderly men uh, of the community they started building this because of its shape because because of the form interesting form they started being uh, excited that they want to be engaged in this center they they told us but in other camps uh, it, it, we we found out that it was opposite but uh, here they were excited to be engaged in an NGO center. And uh, they said, okay, they want to be engaged. And uh, we said, no, it is, it is for the females only. And they said, okay, maybe their uh, wife, their daughter or sisters can be here and uh, uh, interact with us. And we agreed and later they uh, started using the space. So the space sometimes changes uh, with season, with time, and they color it, paint it, and uh, they make it themselves. And, uh, uh, and uh, that amuses us. And uh, this is another project. Uh, uh, later, we did it for another camp. Uh, it is a community uh, center for the Hindu para refugee uh, So, so uh, Rohingya refugees are mostly Muslim, and uh, there is a small refugee camp, uh, a small Hindu para camp that is only accommodating the Hindus. Uh, they are, so they are the minorities within the minority. Like a thousand families live there. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, no one was uh, really drawing much attention to them or how they about their mental health or about their uh, legal issues and everything. Uh, so uh, again, our colleagues uh, tried to design something for them. And uh, at the beginning, we thought of designing something within the camp, but because they were so vulnerable and uh, so uh, 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 insecure and uh, uh, everything, so they really uh, didn't, have trust on us in the first place. So they said, uh, they were saying that uh, we are here to break the temple and all, all sort of things. So in, instantly we had to change the, uh, change the plan. And uh, we, we decided, okay, maybe we can place the structure just adjacent to the camp, uh, uh, not inside it. So, so the blue one is the center and uh, you see it is, uh, it is in the host community and, uh, and uh, uh, the dense uh, shelters that is the refugee community. So now they are both using it. And now it is connect, uh, It is acting like a, a very connecting platform to make uh, understand, to create understanding and uh, friendship among them. So this was the structure before. Uh, it was an abandoned poultry shed, uh, and uh, we, we we got it from a refugee a refugee, uh, not from a refugee, from a host community person. And, uh, and later we converted it to this. So this project, uh, this project had uh, uh, some idea of uh, 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 yeah, uh, durability uh, because it was uh, among the host community, and uh, and uh, all of us thought that maybe uh, if someone if, if someday the refugee is not there anymore, uh, mm -hmm. the host community can keep using it. So we tried to. Uh, use steel and uh, bamboo in a composite manner and try to make it a bit more durable and low maintenance. 
um, and uh, but but uh, even the structure is still modular uh, so that uh, you can plug in uh, the modules and create the space and if you need to shift it somewhere else you can you have the opportunity So the senior root spaces are uh, very playful and we use this pattern with, with color and uh, broken tiles uh, to make the construction process vibrant and uh, uh, a, a joyful event. And uh, you see the modules, uh, these are very uh, flexible and these are very easily installable modules. Uh, uh, and uh, those were the basics. Uh, and, uh, and and those uh, patterns, these created very excitement uh, during the construction. Even the colors in the room, everyone loved it. And uh, and after the construction, these events are very useful for us uh, to arrange workshops, to uh, sessions uh, about environment, about uh, landscaping, about uh, soil, about. Uh, uh, human behavior psychology to uh, to make these spaces uh, uh, engaged to introduce to the, uh, them to a new space. So we uh, we try to arrange these uh, small workshops or small uh, uh, sessions where uh, children can children can uh, page and they can just come around and uh, and they can get introduced to the new space. Uh, and uh, in a similar manner, we have uh, built uh, uh, quite a few other structures. Uh, this is one for the host community. It is not for the refugees. Uh, so it is uh, for a Bangladeshi village. Uh, and uh, this, this is also currently in use and in, in a very good shape. Sometimes uh, architecture has been a tool for us to build trust. Uh, 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 this is a, a renovation and extension work we did for uh, the local government who is running the whole camp area. Um, so they needed a space uh, on their existing building very uh, in a very short time immediately. So what we did was we did some uh, steel construction uh, because the weight was a consideration. We cannot put much weight on the old structure and uh, we added this one floor. And uh, we renovated uh, this whole project was uh, total, uh, probably in four months or five months duration. And uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, with the organizations, we also had to uh, discuss about uh, the reusability of the of these materials because the camp is very um, unpredictable area. And, uh, and uh, there is a lot of wastage of material, like they are building some bamboo shades and in one year it gets rotten, they cannot maintain it and you, they have to change it again. Uh, and sometimes the government says, okay, you have to relocate this space and there is nothing salvageable, nothing you can extract from the old structure. So what we did was we tried to develop some, uh, some schemes uh, that is reusable uh, and uh, uh, the modules can be rebuilt in any other place uh, if you need to change, shift it, shift the uh, center. And, uh, and, and we also work uh, where we are staying. This is uh, our uh, very temporary uh, studio right now. Uh, the, 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 the left one was the previous uh, building you see. We, we, uh, went to the owner. He 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 is a uh, driver by profession, uh, and we tried to create some impact, some dialogue with the low-income group from Yunus too, and uh, try to make some friendship uh, uh, as well. So we took this uh, house uh, 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 from him and renovated it, and and he was involved in the process as well. He was very excited to see his old house converted to some. Uh, Uh, it also helps us to address mental health, uh, enhance culture, and reconnect lost identity. Uh, uh, so this is one project uh, that we did uh, for IOM. Uh, this, uh, we're calling it uh, Rohingya Cultural Memory Center. And uh, the process was healing through making. So this project is basically uh, a, a project from a mental health uh, and psychosocial support uh, unit from IOM. So they wanted to uh, create something, some uh, uh, idea or some notion uh, so that 
culture, uh, creative works, and um, um, uh, and all these things can heal the refugees. So, uh, so, uh, so we started we started uh, documenting their um, uh, what were their cultural elements, what were their practices, and uh, what were the good uh, things that can be further research and uh, spread. Um, so em embroidery work, bamboo work, uh, cane work, a lot of things we found out. Uh, and we started uh, arranging these small sessions, uh, like design, se design sessions, like studios, where they will, uh, they will design, they will draw, they will make models and all sort of things. Uh, so, so the idea was to understand what is their capacity and what is their muscle memory. Uh, what, is, what, what do they remember? And, uh, what is the best skill they have? Because uh, if you ask anyone to build something or draw something, they will uh, do the best uh, 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 what they can uh, in their skill. Uh, uh, what they have the best skill, they will try to do that. So, so uh, we, they came up with a lot of uh, 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 functional things like fishing traps uh, and uh, what they used to have in Myanmar. And uh, these uh, drawings, uh, these represent many panels, colorful panels, building components, and all sorts of things. And uh, this is a drawing by Jabir Pai. He uh, uh, he, uh, uh, we actually, uh, in one session, we actually asked them to design uh, a wall uh, that no one has seen before. Like it, it can be very interesting how imaginative you can go. Um, so, so, uh, uh, so Jabir Bhai, he came up with, uh, with some panels that can be converted to like tables and chairs. Uh, and later uh, he, he, he built this model with wood with so much details that we didn't even expect. We didn't ask for ask him to make this model, but he uh, made this with wastage uh, wood and came to us, and we're so so shocked and surprised uh, to see this. We also arrange uh, workshops with children. Uh, we try to understand their stories, their motor skill, and uh, and what uh, what is their aesthetic sense uh, and that sort of thing. So they they uh, sometimes they draw, sometimes uh, they and some paper cut, uh, paper cut uh, stories and share with us. Not only children, uh, also elderly group members from the organizations, they also come together to uh, plan this whole thing. And it is a fun event for them. So, so everyone, is, everyone is excited to create a new, new structure or new environment. Everyone has some cool idea and they want to be involved. And we found out a lot of uh, uh, indigenous solutions and uh, what were their traditions, uh, like uh, the Nipapam palette leaf, they used to make their houses with. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in Cox's Bazar, uh, Tekna area, uh, uh, we, we don't have this uh, uh, much in use right now because it was here before, but and it is not a very common thing right now. But we could source it uh, nearby and so we, we brought these materials. And again, we arranged workshops where the elderly can teach the new generations uh, who cannot make this. Uh, so it's, it's an exchange of knowledge and uh, uh, indigenous techniques. And later they made the roof with, with this leaf. And uh, sometimes we make very small models to understand what we're going to build. And uh, we uh, subconsciously, we find out very similar similarity from the workshops. Uh, uh, you see from uh, in the left, uh, it, is a, it is a drawing by one artisan. So uh, during a workshop, he was saying he needed a space uh, uh, if, he, if he wants to heal his mental uh, state. He needs a very meditative space. There will be a very uh, a courtyard inside and layers of spaces around. So, so later it reflected in our uh, project and uh, in our design as well. Very, very subconsciously, we didn't really intend it. Okay, maybe we want this uh, in our design. No, but that information was in our head, and uh, and, uh, and during the design process, it came out. Uh, and later, uh, it looks like this. The space looks like this. Uh, there are three, uh, four gardens inside the uh, whole structure. And you see a lot of a uh, lot of bamboo patterns. Like uh, no, not one single pattern will uh, be exactly like another one. There are a lot of varieties because they took the challenge to show their 
what they have got, what they got and uh, they said we have like four 30 or 40 types of pattern and we want to make it very uh, different uh, every panel should be different and, and not similar to one another so we are yeah uh, we said okay go ahead and it's the freedom we should have during the construction and uh, and and the young refugees they also uh, were very um, uh, they uh, innovative. They wanted to make new things. So we gave them the idea that uh, okay, maybe you can we uh, design a very durable screen with bamboo uh, that 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 will allow light and ventilation, but it will be it will protect the interior. Uh, so they instantly uh, started making some samples, and we came to uh, this solution. And uh, this, the screen looks like this. It is very durable uh, from outside, uh, but but uh, still it creates some excitement to, to see, to think. And, uh, and the light is quite interesting for us. And uh, all sort of work, the, the artwork, uh, whatever they had, we tried to incorporate in this uh, center as a, as a symbol or as a piece of memory because it's memory center. And uh, they made a lot of uh, 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 windows uh, that represent their memories, uh, different types of windows, and they later they assembled uh, one panel and, uh, and this looks like this. So all the, all the windows, these are made by individual artisans and these windows represent their personal memory and what they like. Uh, so, uh, so it's a process that uh, to remember and to uh, make new, uh, ma uh, to make new thing and to heal through the through the whole process. And they were very innovative, uh, and uh, we gave the complete freedom to go to to be. They made the tiles like this. Uh, there are a lot of patterns you can see, like boats, sun. Flowers and everything, and uh, and uh, you see that uh, the the structure itself uh, probably it doesn't have the finest workmanship uh, because we didn't really look for that. So we really wanted this whole event to be enjoyable, and we wanted to include everyone. Uh, like if someone really doesn't have the a very fine workmanship, we we wanted to include him or her as well and we wanted him to develop through the process uh, uh we, we didn't want to exclude anyone so you'll see a lot of flaws a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, flaws in the center but that is uh, okay for us uh, and the spaces looks like this and uh, and currently uh, this this is being used with different uh, the officials different organizations. And uh, the idea was to give the Rohingya refugees an uh, identity that they are, they, uh, what are their roots and where do they come from? And they have a vibrant background uh, because they, these background this history is being lost and that they need to preserve it to, uh, to prove the world that Rohingya community is a unique community. So uh, it is happening right now many people come and appreciate the space and they look at their work and uh, they wish them well uh, in, in a similar uh, similar scheme this is another project this is also a health facility like there is a mental health uh, corner and uh, health, uh, health facilities in the center so so uh, this was also very temporary like uh, uh, we had to use some toilet rings for the foundation so that uh, you, you can really uh, dismantle it when it is uh, necessary. And the spaces looks. And, uh, and the uh, uh, rooms for the doctors or the health specialists, uh, we had to put uh, boards uh, where it is easily, they can clean easily uh, because bamboo or natural material, it is sometimes a uh, uh, difficult to maintain hygiene or difficult, difficult to clean very easily. Uh, so that is why we, we had to make it composite. So whatever we have in hand in a very short time, we try, we try to assemble it and make the best out of it. 
sometimes we work just to kickstart a future vision, uh, just maybe uh, 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 add in some workshops. Uh, Fatmi is there, she added this workshop, and uh, uh, we attended. And, uh, uh, and we try to uh, uh, plan uh, the neighborhood with the village community, so it, it is a Bangladesh community. So it, it was a uh, wash, uh, 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 wash focused workshop where we wanted to redesign the sanitation system, the wash facilities, the water network, and also that. So we, we sat with the community and we mapped the whole area and we tried to come up with solutions. And we presented this to higher officials where, uh, where they can take decisions. So it is not that we always have to build now, uh, but we, we have we, we sometimes uh, try to create the opportunity for future works. And uh, uh, this uh, photo resembles uh, uh, the, the excitement among the children and the participants uh, or different professionals. Like uh, they, they all like to draw, they all like to throw their ideas and uh, do the same. So, so, uh, so uh, the last project we did uh, uh, in Howard, uh, in, in the flood affected uh, Silate area. Um, so it, it was for uh, Institute of Architects Bangladesh, IAB. Uh, and uh, uh, the basic idea was to go there uh, after the recent devastating flood and try to understand uh, what can be done in the future and uh, what should be the roles of architects uh, there. So. So we went there and uh, we tried to understand what is the ongoing scenario and uh, what is the practice and try to sit with them and discuss what, it, what, what they had to go through and what can be improved and that sort of thing. And uh, in this, uh, we, we stayed in a village with the community for seven days. And in this village, we found out that there is one uh, madrasa that is a Islamic school uh, and uh, we, we uh, decided to build a floatable structure for them just as a test maybe we, it, just, just as a uh, souvenir just a, a token of friendship that we are here we want to uh, build something and want to make friendship for future work uh, it is also an experimental work for us uh, a floatable floating structure uh, but uh, but we are we are still uh, observing uh, how it reacts and uh, how it sustains and uh, what are the maintenance uh, issues and everything. Uh, but uh, but these are very important to create our presence uh, because again uh, we we aim to uh, we aim to work in a sustainable manner in a long term manner and uh, these small tokens uh, small activities uh, create the opportunities and options. So later, uh, this was uh, handed over to the children and uh, they painted uh, their village again. And uh, we also built this uh, very important structure, the uh, wash facilities that they lack of. Uh, and, uh, and these are very as, as important to us uh, uh, like the other structures. Uh, that the very basic need, uh, a wash facility that is missing there, we have to build it beautifully. So we do it that as well. So uh, yeah, this is it. Uh, that, that was my presentation. Uh, uh, so sometimes uh, we think of, uh, 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 we, we talk about like, uh, let's think outside the box, but maybe architects need, need to uh, uh, re rethink their roles and try to make the box bigger because they can do a lot of things, uh, just not just design buildings or spaces, but they can educate and make good impacts in many other ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rizvi. If you can stop sharing, then we can say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so you should keep your camera on so we can have the discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nepal and uh, Rizvi. That was fantastic. I'm, I mean, I'm thrilled uh, in the way we've started off this conversation. Um, and to have had the two of you as the inaugural speakers, uh, I think you've you've brought home and reinforced all the agendas we want to bring to the discussion, uh, which is how one can at a very basic level uh, and going up uh, connect with communities, but also give architecture some instrumentality 
which it desperately needs. Um, you know, so I just want to make a few comments and then let's start a discussion. Uh, what I what 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 struck me was actually while at one level one can read just because bamboo is such a common protagonist in both your work, uh, one can read it as very similar. But I see an incredibly different uh, thing here, which is that uh, in the case of Nepal, I think. I think you you are you created a context and you are creating a context. And I think Rizvi, what you all are doing is you are taking a context and digging much deeper into it. Uh, and you know, I was very struck, Nepal, by that image you showed, the Google image of how you cultivated the bamboo along the river to stabilize it and to almost bring it at the centerpiece of people's lives in a way that then it not only stabilizes the very context or the terrain that they live and work in, uh, but then it begins to be something that can actually also give them the habitat uh, that they want. I mean, just symbolically, uh, although that was very localized to the land you showed us, it's a very powerful gesture. And so it made me think about this notion that you also create a context sometimes, uh, a context that might have been lost, you reclaim it, right? And I think what Rizvi, you showed us is how you can uh, you can take a context and read from it layers of meaning, uh, which then you can address all the way from cultural uh, memory uh, to just sort of basic needs. And so I think for me, while the visual similarities between these two exist so much, uh, this was a fundamental uh, kind of framing device that I was using in my head as I was listening to you all. And, you know, there were three or four questions or issues that came up, which I'd just like to elaborate my own responses, and I hope we can open it up for discussion. I mean, I think, Nepali, I think the way you started with the vernacular, and then you use the word kacha, which is, well, temporary or, you know, uh, or the opposite of pakka, which is permanent. Uh, so whether it's temporary and permanent or some other formation, I don't know. Uh, but I think that's just a very interesting question for us to ponder about in the context of South Asia. And for two reasons. Uh, one is there are connotations that are negative with it, that it is associated with the poor, it is associated when the resources are very minimal, et cetera. But in truth, I mean, you said it in passing, Rizvi, you said, yeah, and this can be that mental health, um, uh, uh, you know, not hospital clinic, and it's temporary when they don't need it, it can go. So that's another way to look at it. And, you know, the way I frame it often as a provocation to my students, but to the profession, is are we often making permanent solutions for temporary problems? Uh, and sometimes we have to also think in terms of the life cycle of what we are doing. And so I think, I think it's contingent upon us as a community uh, to re redefine, create new narratives around the notions of the temporary and the permanent, the kacha and the pakka, uh, and unpack all the negative connotations that go with it, because I think we can use this very productively in a positive way uh, in societies of transition where we have to go from one to the other without getting locked in any paradigm. And I think that's a very powerful idea that you all both touch upon. And I hope in the course of this series, we can, uh, we can evolve and discuss these. The second one, I think, which is very common in both your presentations is just the awareness to use space and architecture instrumentally, all the way from the larger systemic ways that you address it in terms of building and building components and how they come together, all the way to the tactile. I mean, I love that notion, Ripal, of you saying the children use it as a jungle gym, you know, uh, the fact that they can actually embrace the material uh, is quite, um, is quite uh, beautiful. So the two big questions, and these were just my observations. I hope it helps. Maybe you can respond or not respond. That's fine. But the two questions that I'd like to carry on a bit of a discussion about, one is the notion of patronage. Uh, I think you, I would like you all to elaborate a little bit more on it. Um, again, in the process of creating a context, Ripal, I think uh, it wasn't clear about that first school it seemed to me you, it was a, like a self-initiated project then got ratified and the government felt it was safe. Then you all did a few government projects and the government changed their mind and you went and did something else. And I'd like to just sort of understand or we'd like to understand what those forms of patronage were 
that took you. Yes, the single family homes and all are clear, but there were many like the library. I mean, how did that happen, et cetera, would be interesting to hear because for younger architects, that's a big question. How do you make a practice like this happen? And I think in your case, Rizvi, the, the question of patronage is much clearer. There's a lot of self-initiation you all are doing, but then you find patronage with BRAC, you find patronage with, 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 with funding organizations that are working there. Now, of course, what you do is make those same organizations see architecture more sensitively because they can otherwise replicate international norms and they're completely irrelevant, which has been the problem. So I think how you correct you, how you take patronage like that, but you also make it land on the ground, I think is interesting. And it would be nice to hear some anecdotes from you about the challenges you face doing that, right? I mean, you took the route of your mentor in BRAC, getting organizations that are sensitive to the locality to be engaged first, but then you're also dealing with more powerful forces which sometimes make us do the wrong things because they have international norms and standards. Uh, which, uh, you know, the universalizing of standards in architecture is also a huge problem, which intersects with the notion in Nepal of what you were saying is kacha and pakka. The, uh, the, you know, so bamboo, because it wasn't wood, you, it was to your advantage in terms of regulations, but buildings, because they look kacha, the government bylaws get nervous about them, right? So this is a double-edged sword. And so I think this issue of patronage, I'd like you all both to respond to. And then, of course, the last question is, and that's something that goes through everybody's mind, which is the notion of replicability, right? Uh, and you all are both already showing how you're replicating these things at different scales uh, and yet making very robust solutions. And so replicability and the challenges with replicability, replicability are also an important issue. And I think these issues that, that I've outlined, the kacha, pakka, that dichotomy, the notion of patronage, the idea of the instrumentality of architecture and its agency, and the notion of reflect uh, of, of replicability is going to go through all these lectures, I think, for the next year. And I think uh, the commonalities of South Asia in forms of patronage, government's role, NGOs, the conflicts is going to be the one of the, you know, the, the very textured common ground that we're all going to discuss. So I'll stop talking and I'd like you all to just reflect a little bit on patronage replicability and any other challenges. So Ripple, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, thanks Raul. Yeah, it's a very important concept, you know, like patronage is very political, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like there's two aspects to patronage. One is the regulation aspect, you know, like, you know, if, and then the government bodies come in and the international NGOs like World Bank, ADB, you know, because they are the biggest funders. So like, how are the, you know, the patronage of the material? Like, is it, if they say it is safe, it is safe, like people think it's right. Like, for example, I showed like so many buildings, which I mean, have, you know, are more than a few hundred years old, but now they are not considered safe because the government patronage is not there, right? For example, after the earthquake, you know, like we were pushing for like um, certain materials, but you know, the government is hesitant because, you know, government is also taking loan from World Bank and they're saying, oh, this is not safe, right? We want to build back better, right? So, so then, you know, like the patronage cannot, we cannot look at it in isolation, right? We cannot be like, okay, like, uh, because if I want to, you know, it's kind of, we are like, a rebel, being very rebellious in our architecture because as you said, it is considered temporary, which is to our advantage because we are building <laughs> long lasting temporary structures, right? Um, so the government is kind of saying, oh, bamboo is temporary, so you can build whatever you want, you know, so that's to our advantage. But when we say kacha, we are not saying in terms of temporary. We love the idea of like, you know, temporal structure, which you very often talk about, you know, we live in the mountains, like sometimes like they are like, you know, like bringing helicopters to the mountains with like tons of cement and concrete and steel and building um, these structures where people only live for three months, four months, right? Yeah. So in those cases, you know, like these temporary structures, like, you know, the bamboo tent or, you know, like how the Mongolians use the yurts, 
could be an amazing um, application. Uh, so, so my concept, my issue or my irritation with the word kacha is not that it is temporal, but it is weak, you know? So that's what I'm contesting, you know? It's yeah. not weak because if it can last the earthquake, you know, like it, that's the biggest test yeah. of time. In fact, that's the interesting thing, you know, because then that's, that's why it's such an interesting pairing, the two of you, because you're building in the mountains where the earth is shaking uh, and your, your what is kacha is actually the most stable uh, and in fact, the most permanent, which is the interesting flip. And in the case of Rizvi, he's building where the earth disappears because the water takes over sometimes. Uh, and therefore he's, the issues are different, but you're not employing the same set of materials or attitudes towards building, which is fascinating that buildings like that, which is knowledge from the vernacular, buildings of the soil, can actually straddle such a diverse set of problems and issues, which is really fascinating. So no, that's a very nice redefinition of what we were calling kacha in the sense, in the sense it's for you, it's the new permanent in some ways. Exactly. It's <laughs> permanent, but it could be temporary, right? Yeah, it yeah, could yeah. Be like, you know, like for example- or stable, that, it's the most stable. It's exactly. the most stable, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I say, like you can like, you know, take these structures down, take it somewhere and rebuild it. You know, like we have traditions where like people actually take uh, roofs or, you know, they carry the roofs and take it uh, somewhere else, you know, when they have to move their houses. Right. So, I mean, we are kind of celebrating that we are not saying, yeah, we have to build like permanent structures and, you know, so, yeah, we so the flexibility that material gives, you know, like um, how Rizvi is using it in a very different context, like you were saying, where the soil is very porous and, you know, malleable. And for us where, you know, like it's very steep, yeah. like how do we use this material, you know, which is so lightweight, so, you know. Um, in Nepal, before, before we go to Rizvi, can you just very quickly tell us a little bit about patronage? How was that first project done and how did you, how did your trajectory form from there? Okay, actually, it's really interesting because my first project, you know, like the first, uh, the hall I did in the school, the school was self, you know, we got ourselves fun, but the first project was uh, a donor driven project, you know. So, and they wanted to create a sustainable structure, you know, like, you know, all the buzzwords. And I'm like going there, and the people are like, we don't want this, we want something else, right? So I found that hostility and I'm like thinking like, you know, am I doing because the donors are saying, and I'm, am I imposing my idea of what's sustainable to people? And that kind of like, really, I got very uncomfortable with that. You know, I'm like, if people are not interested, you know, if people are interested in just building uh, a concrete structure, maybe that's what I should do or somebody else should do, but you know, I don't want to be imposing, you know, because that that friction and the hostility. Am I just building because some um, big donors want to, you know, like make a climate sensitive building? And so uh, that really uh, that bothered me. And so then I said, you know, I want to be a private company for the reason that I it has to come from it has to be market driven, you know. Because if it's market driven, that means people want it, you know? And so there will be like, you know, a lot of like quality control and be like, you know, I, why isn't this working? You know, I didn't want to be uh, creating some like, um, you know, like a museum or some like, you know, like artifact, but I want something like a shelter. Yeah, and so which people are paying for it. So, and slowly I changed my trajectory, you know? And so I, and like many of our projects, it's all, uh, um, the patronage, it's a private uh, enterprise, you know, like people come, they pay for our services, you know, and so, and we, I feel very nice about it because that means the acceptability, you know, it's, it's there, but I'm not denying, I'm not saying like there's no role for some uh, uh, charity work because so, certain things, because we are starting like from zero, you know, like we are working with, like we, we're going against the stream, you know, we are fighting with, with like conventional material that has so much patronage and so much um, credibility. So we need that support, we need that handholding, you know, like to take that, um, take this material into a newer context. But I think the best test would be when like the locals are coming and like, you know, putting their money on the table and saying, I want a house like this, right? Mm -hmm. So that for us gives that 
uh, acceptance. Thank you. Uh, Rizvi, if you could just reflect on the notion of patronage and yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, as I said, presence has been very important for us. Uh, uh, whether we, we are going there to design a building, uh, a space or uh, just, just an Excel sheet, <laughs> uh, but presence has been uh, the key to us. Uh, because uh, when we are first uh, contacted uh, or called in this context, we are not asked to design anything. Uh, we were actually asked to document and prepare some drawings for some old structures, uh, uh, some old cyclone shelters, how they can be renovated and that sort of thing. Uh, and when we uh, came here, uh, the, the uh, interaction and uh, idea, idea sharing with others, that opened up many windows. Um, and these conversations, okay, maybe we can design a space, uh, okay, maybe design, we can design a garden, uh, or maybe a process, some workshops. So uh, these conversations uh, actually opened up to uh, a lot of uh, possibilities so within BRAC, and, and later, when we started working with BRAC, there were, there were a lot of, lot of whispers, and uh, in other organizations that this, these uh, young kids are working there, and uh, there is a process, and uh, they are connecting with the sectors, and uh, uh, components. So, uh, so later they started coming to us, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, it, it was actually uh, the first uh, one and a half year or two years we really had to prove our worth that uh, we can make something interesting, uh, and uh, that uh, it is uh, worth to take these decisions or the, uh, this process. So uh, later, of some uh, IOM and uh, many others started coming to us and saying that oh, okay, they want to build something, but not just the building, they also were excited about the process uh, because that were targeting a lot of uh, projects they had uh, already going on. Uh, and now what is happening is there are a lot of private clients uh, who they are actually uh, looking at these, uh, on, uh, at these publications, at these uh, online videos we're publishing, and they are excited to uh, design spaces that uh, that does the good will to the community uh, that has the good will so uh, uh, so i think uh, for us it was like step by step uh, we, we were very patient and we we just try to be useful in any 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 way because we have a lot of skills visualization skill we, we have some education basic education and uh, uh, that can be used in any sector so that helped us grow and right now private uh, clients are also coming uh, to, to take this uh, process, and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, replicability about the replic replicability, I would say construction is a very difficult process itself. Uh, the daily labor and uh, building it, it's, it's it's very hectic. So uh, uh, the process can be very much replicable. How how beautiful you can make it. Uh, and uh, how uh, uh, how it can target the mental well-being of the of anyone who is involved with the whole process. It can be replicated in any context if you have the goodwill, uh, and uh, and uh, it doesn't have to stop in one construction. So uh, so I see it like that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Amna. Would you want to ask some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, firstly, thank you so much, Nepal and Rizvi, for your presentations. I was just uh, drawing parallels and thinking about your work and um, thinking about how you're both very active listeners in your communities and listening to your histories, traditions, and culture and the use of material and how that reflects into your work. I was curious more about um, how architecture, one, it, it's rooted in time and place, but also it has that character of being an active part of society. I was wondering if you could both um, maybe talk about how your relationship has been uh, post completion of your projects, whether there's been evolution of potential for expansion and uh, what's that been like? Mm, can I? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah. So, you know, like, as I said before, we, there is no, which I, see it, uh, you know, as not as a complaint, but there is no standard for bamboo, right? There is, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, in a modern context, it's a relatively new material, right? It's only in last 10 years, 15 years, people are using it. And people are using it in South America, people are using it in like Africa, Bangladesh, Nepal. 
And we have a different challenges. We have a different context and we are evolving. Like, you know, we're creating our own trajectory. It's, it's kind of like very interesting, you know, like how we're looking at the same material in totally different um, context and different perspective. So, and as we go, as we are building, we are, we're learning, you know, it's uh, as we build, you know, like we've started as a very simple, humble, like a one story structure. Now we're comfortable to do like a bigger structure, a two story structure. Now we are building like a uh, four story structures. So it's, there's a lot of evolution. And as we are doing, we are learning. Um, and also, you know, like, as you said, we are very, very receptive to what people are asking. You know, we're not like, uh, we're not fundamentalists. We are not like bamboo talibans, right? We're like, this is not, we want to be like, you know, like, okay, what, what are people asking for, you know? So uh, we are very open to, you know, combining it with different materials and like, you know, pushing the limit, you know? For me, it's, as I said, I, I am interested in this material for the poetry of it, right? So, you know, like how I can push the limits. So, and to, to give it new avenues. So yeah, and it's definitely definitely evolving. Thank you. Rizvi, do you want to respond to that in any way about how things evolve? And... Uh, yes, uh, so uh, uh, after any construction, we are always connected with uh, the craftsmen or who was uh, involved in the project and, and they share, okay, this is a new thing they are doing and uh, they need something new. So, uh, so it is always ongoing uh, and if they if they need a new extension, sometimes they come to us. But but in most cases, the artisans uh, they are already trained and they can do better. Uh, so they take the lead uh, in any new extension and all sort of all sort of things. So we sometimes visit there and uh, just keep the connection. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And we also had some questions in the chat. Um, the first one is by Ursul, and he's asking about the friction that exists between modern technologies and how they can be reconciled with vernacular building techniques. Um, thinking about how as technology penetrates more and more into the rural and the remote. Um, would you both have any comments on that? In fact, I just want to add to that because, I mean, I think there's also implicit in that question the notion that uh, many aspects of our lives get very high tech in the way we use the internet with the way we use cell phones. And then uh, on the same time, architecture uh, is uh, now drawing from the vernacular, are these reconcilable? And it's a, it's a very interesting irony uh, that, uh, you know, even in Silicon Valley, the guys who own all the high-tech companies, they want villas in the classical style and they want to go back in terms of imagery. So maybe architecture is a stabilizing effect. So I'm, I'm just restating that question in another way, just to get your responses. Actually, I am very open to using technologies. You know, like these days, people are talking about parametric structures, right? Yeah. And I'm like, hey, bring that technology to bamboo and you'll be laughing because it's such a malleable, flexible, you know, ductile material. You'd be like, there'd be so much flexibility, you know, uh, with, you know, like, like with this conventional material, I think it's very limited. Right, unless you go into like you know carbon fibers or like really complex state of the art materials, but yeah, if you can bring in these technologies to um, you know certain like vegetable based you know fiber based materials, it can be like really interesting. So, I'm really open, like, I think open to using technologies in our design, you know, like, but for me, as a, a similar with Risby, for me, craft is fundamental for me, like, building is, is a craft, it's not a machine, you know, like um, Corbusier said, for me, it's like your skin. It's like, you know, extension of your skin. So it's, uh, for me, the craft element has to be there, right? So, but if it kind of, if technology kind of aids it, you know, if it can, you know, like expand our, like how we visualize things or like, you know, how we uh, play with the materials, I'd be very open to it. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'll, 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 uh... I'm, I will agree with uh, Nepal that uh, technology is very important and uh, uh, that can make the architect uh, very useful in the context. Uh, uh, 
uh, because it opens up a lot of possibility and he, it gives us the design control. Um, so, uh, but how we are using it and uh, if, if we are allowing everyone to share it uh, together, that is the question. Uh, am I uh, taking the technology myself and just keeping it to myself and uh, 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 it is not inclusive at all. Uh, so that is that that will not work for us uh, in that case. But but uh, let's say I am visualizing it and the artisans are there to give the suggestions and uh, uh, it's, it's another discussion. Uh, so that will be a very brilliant uh, event for us. Uh, so any uh, advanced tool like Rhino, Grasshopper, we also are open about it, uh, like uh, 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 so yeah, technology. Thank you. Amna, did you have anything else? Should I go? Um, yeah, sure. Okay. No, no, I just wanted to, as all good things come to an end, and you know, we are running out of time now, but I just wanted to say two things. One is, well, besides, of course, thanking you both for participating. And I hope that you will also participate in the other talks because I think uh, these will build and we can carry on the conversation. We might even have a format where we might get you into the discussion like this so we can you know, extend some of these thoughts. And you know, I think uh, also the issues that come out of each of these we'll build on and the issues that come out here, which I hope I can as moderating this bring up in the next ones is the notion of the context and the way y'all have both addressed it in different ways and then how the context has inverted. And uh, Nepal, you very beautifully said that, that where the kacha in that context becomes the more pakka uh, and vice versa, right? Uh, and uh, and in Rizvi, in the context you're working on, that can take on a completely different meaning. Uh, and so let's try to pick up on this a little further. I think patronage is going to be very important because I think we have to understand that better to even be, uh, uh, how do you say, effective as architects. And, and you know, Nepal, what you were, and both Rizvi, you all were, what, what, what you all are both doing, and you all were both, in a, in a way, you've struggled with and you are also trying to articulate, is make this bridge between the governments and the more powerful forces and the needs of the aspirations of what is relevant locally, right? So you're kind of negotiating between those two ends, which is what makes us part of civil society. That's what civil society should be. Uh, and then of course, there's the good things of architecture, space, its instrumentality, the tactile nature. Like you said, Nepal, the malleability of carbon fibers and bamboo being replicated, bring parameters into it. Let's you know, embrace technology. So these are, I think, issues that would be worth us extending as a collective conversation. And I really, really very sincerely invite you and request you to be part of those conversations, yeah, which we now will have on October 8th and October 15th and going on like that every second Saturday. So wherever you can come, please, please join us. The last thing I want to stay, say in closing uh, is uh, really one well, thanks to everyone who's on the screen, the student group and the Lakshmi Mittal Institute. But I just want to go back to our theme and our question of the architecture of transition and looking as a sub, you know, that is an uh, idea to look at the state of architecture in South Asia. And listening to you both, uh, you know, in Nepal, especially your last uh, comments, and then I think Rizvi, as you said, yes, bring software, bring other things we want to, is, you know, the interesting thing about transitions is that they are not absolute solutions in the way Corbusier was, uh, what Corbusier was telling us was about absolute solutions. Transitionary solutions are very nimble. Uh, they move in directions. You know, it's like uh, the energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables sometimes has to go through nuclear and come there because otherwise you can't make the jump directly, which is what you struggle with governments, et cetera. And the other thing about transitions is that what you might finally land up doing might be quite different from what you intended because in transitions, you learn along the way. Uh, you accumulate knowledge along the way. And I think we have to find ways that we can be reflective about that knowledge and accumulate it, uh, because that's what would make transitions a robust category versus absolute solutions, which we know have failed us and failed large parts of society in many ways. And in the context of South Asia, that becomes an even more kind of acute uh, uh, and extreme problem. So I hope we can carry on these conversations. Thanks so much for making the time. Thanks so much uh, for you know articulating beautifully your beautiful work. 
uh, and we, we really appreciate it and look forward to having you as part of the conversations as we go along. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Anna. And thank you so much. Anna. Thanks, Rizvi. Thank you.